Can you see it? Yes, perfectly well. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to receive you this uh, morning or this afternoon. And uh, let me share then some uh, figures of the adoption of IPv6 in the region. They are similar to what we showed in May at uh, the LACNIC event with an addition, with a surprise that I'm keeping for the end. So without further ado, this slide, although this is not statistic, I never get tired of showing it, first of all, because it reminds me of my childhood. And uh, this uh, uh, explains why we continue to push for IPv6. This is a, a magazine that's called uh, um, a Popular Mechanic, uh, Mechanics, um, and it says that uh, the 32 bits uh, um, uh, addressing uh, system is one of, uh, scheme is one of the most tangible examples of how the internet is bursting at the seams. And so there they provide some predictions that were, that were not full, fulfilled. But at present, if you were to ask me whether the seams are bursting, well, I think that this is the time when the seams are beginning to burst. And why it isn't IPv4 enough? Because for a long time, we um, uh, run out of uh, numbers. We um, Everything that we do now compromise the uh, scaling of the network. And uh, indeed, we need to enable the uh, growth of the internet beyond uh, any uh, um, the usage. And the objective of this presentation is to show you some figures of adoption of IPv6, always fighting against uh, that myth uh, uh, of people saying that IPv6 was never used, that nobody used it. As a matter of fact, I, the other day I had a talk with somebody that continues to say that nobody uses IPv6. Now, this is one of the big myths of IPv6 today that nobody uses it, but you'll see at the end that about one out of five users in our region are using IPv6, and that's not a minor issue. Um, so, we, what do we, we, there's no way back. We have to go on deeper. So this uh, has to do with, uh, what, what is this uh, indicator measure? It uh, estimates rather than measures because it's an estimation through a proxy. It's an estimate that for a certain a population that would be a country or an autonomous system that is an operator's network of the universe of users in that population, how many of them have access to contents available in IPv6. So when you see the percentages that I'm going to show, and I'm going to show it by country, although the figures are also available through the autonomous systems, if you want to access them really, what you need to think is that what the percentage says measures is um, the number of users of that country that can access IPv6 contents if offered. So that doesn't mean that all the contents that the people have access to is available in IPv6. That should be the result of another measure that I'm going to discuss at the end. So how do you measure? And it, it, it's interesting to, to uh, bear this in mind because of all measurements, it has its limitations. So what they do is they present a block of contents that is done through Google publicity that has uh, Google advertisements and they present some parts that are uh, um, visible through IPv4 and IPv6. So after processing that, you can see, you can estimate how many users can have access to one and to the other. So let's look at the numbers. We, in this was in May, and from May to June, almost nothing has changed. We are in the uh, LACNIC subregions. Notice that we have, there are some countries with very significant figures or in Brazil, well, look at uh, the figures of Brazil and Uruguay, almost 40%. French Guiana too, although it's small. Ecuador, Peru, Paraguay, and Argentina are there. 
And although uh, I didn't have enough room because it would have been very small type, but there are two newcomers in this ranking that are Colombia and Paraguay. And the other is Bolivia, who's also increasing. So Paraguay this time entered the ranking. Colombia and Paraguay grew a lot by more than 10% in just a few months. And that's excellent news. And it's going to show how, when the deployments start to happen, the growth of the traffic is very quick. The average of this part of the region is 27 point something percent. In Central America, in Mexico, we have Mexico with a very high penetration, almost 42%. And Guatemala has grown a lot, but 20%. Although the, the average of this region is 34, a bit uh, more than South America, but notice that uh, it's because of the penetration in Mexico, but there are several countries, many countries that are lagging behind. In the Caribbean, this is where there's a greater lag. There are several countries that don't have significant deployment and those that do, many of them uh, have rather special situations. Uh, in the LACNIC region, we can identify Trinidad and Tobago and Dominican Republic with uh, significant deployment, especially Trinidad and Tobago, almost 27% in Trinidad and Tobago. And I always highlight the case of Trinidad because it's one of the examples of how a newcomer to the telecom business is obliged to start using IPv6 because when they established the market, though they had no other way out. It, they, own, they couldn't get any IPv4 resources. So this is what I wanted to tell you that I brought somehow. Uh, it's, this is a sort of surprise. This is a preliminary study that uh, has to do, it's underway. It's those websites, the contents that are accessed in the region that uh, have, well, in some cases they don't have IPv6, but don't worry, I won't identify anyone. I'm just going to give you some comments per country, but I want to show this is what we started doing and that the idea is to extend it and to do it more regular. So first, the history. You know that there's a service through an Amazon uh, subsidiary that's called Alexa. Please uh, don't uh, get confused. Uh, but um, And what they do is to estimate the most visited places in each country. This ranking was available for all the countries in the region. Almost all of them. I think that there's some exception. And and you'll see that there's a ranking of those countries. You'll see the sites that are more accessed. It was a bit surprising to see that most of the first in the rankings are sites that are global content providers, such as Google, Google Search, YouTube, some, and sometimes instead of google.com, you see google.com and then the code, the country code, but in the end it's about the same. And then Facebook and Netflix. And not surprisingly, in many countries, Zoom comes uh, in. Um, and, um, but the analysis that we started to do consists of taking this ranking and not considering those that are global and to stay with uh, those more local. So because of the CCTLD that they use it because it's not a global supplier. Global content providers, they all have IPv6, practically everyone and those who have sex in our region and access these sites, they do it through IPv6 already. So that is not an exhaustive list. I just identified 30 sites. I basically considered the top three or top four in some of the countries in our region. And what we did is to analyze how many of them publish uh, for 
ATS record or registry because that would be step zero, if you may, for a website to work under IPv6. Unless you have that for a registry uh, published, you will never have access to IPv6. So it is a requisite or prerequisite, but it's not enough. It would be like step one. So it's interesting to see how many of these have taken that first step. I'll then publish the full uh, list. It's just a text document. There are some sites that I know there are. Well, Mercado Libre is a very popular site. Infobias is a news website. El Intransigente, I'm not sure what that site is. There are some banks. I think Pichincha is a bank in Ecuador. Banga Camps, I have no idea what it is, but it's one of the most visited websites in several countries. And then the result of that study shows, I'll confess that I was expecting to see fewer. I found that around 26% or seven out of 30 have IPv6 uh, published. And with the, with the tests I did, if you are using a browser and look at where we are coming from many of these objects, it's IPv6. In many of the cases where this is available, where the 4A registry is published in DNS is through uh, content distribution networks, CDNs. Access through IPv6 is well mostly done by all CDNs now. So it is very likely that many of these sites were didn't even do it in, intentionally, which is good news for me because it, that's the promise of IPv6. If we do it right, it should be transparent, transparent not only for the users, maybe not 100% of the situations, but for content uh, providers as well. I'm sure that more, oh, many of you are asking, well, which ones are the ones they have it and which ones aren't? I'm not gonna name any names right now, but it's very easy, uh, a DNS query, it's very easily uh, done. Now, the fact that there are CDNs through that service makes an interesting promise in the sense that maybe the barrier to incorporate some IPv6 uh, access versions to some website might not be as high as it was before, and it doesn't imply a huge investment in infrastructure or setting our equipment in a sort of complex manner. And that our additional signs that might help us realize that this IPv6 uh, sex is sort of a mature protocol that is ready to be used. And that will be all on my end. Are there any questions? I think we still have a few minutes. Thank you, Carlos, for your presentation. Yes, yeah, so we do have a few minutes in case there are any questions from our attendees. There are no questions so far, but let me encourage everyone to Please ask Carlos any questions. You can use the Q&A chat. So let's see if any, if any questions come up. Everyone knows how to contact me really and I will be online for the rest of the afternoon. So if you have any questions, let me know. Carlos, if you, uh, if, you don't mind, maybe you can write your email address on the chat box and maybe people can reach out to you and maybe ask any questions that you they might have. I think there might be one question, Sandra. Okay, let me read it. Alberto says, when is the 50% IPv6 coverage expected to come about? I really, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't dare to set a time frame based on on growth, on current growth. I would say a few years, let's say five years into the future, but I think it could happen earlier than that because growth itself, it's more intermittent. Maybe it's not maybe linear growth. It's not. It, it, when there's a deployment, but a large operator, 
penetration spikes quite quickly. And that's how it has grown so far. Paraguay, for example, as I said earlier, it grew about 12% in a matter of a few months. Then it went stagnant for a little bit and then it spiked again. So I'm not sure, I, I wouldn't dare to, to set a time frame, but I would say three to five years. The lacking region, that's for the lacking region. I think in other regions, they'll reach that 50% even earlier than that. Thank you, Carlos. There aren't any further questions on our Q and A section, but there is one in our in our chat room. The use of CG NAT by ISPs has stopped the growth of IPv6. Vladimir is asking this question. I would I would say that they have nothing to do with one another. IPv6 could even be seen as an as an element to manage these costs. If you are taking traffic away from these, you are taking uh, carrier gene uh, traffic away. I think it, it is unavoidable. I mean, IPv6 uh, run out so uh, IPv4 run out so fast that this is unavoidable. We are always speaking against it, but maybe it's a necessary evil. We will need it. CG uh, not. I don't think that growth has stopped. Actually, quite the opposite. I think it's starting to grow even faster, even in our region. Thank you. Jose, see, we, we do have more questions coming, coming out. Jose Govea wants to know which, what's a good platform for IPv6 uh, security and to learn about it? That's a good question, Jose. I think that the first step would be whatever I use for IPv4 uh, in terms of security, maybe a firewall, I would do the same for sex. We would use the same rules unless, oh, of of course, different uh, different features, but we should use the same security policy. So I would say that the first step would be to have parallel security policies in one and the other. And then maybe in some specific cases, we might want to mitigate specific vulnerabilities for IPv6 uh, road FPs, for example, which are very traditional attacks that would require us to do something particular to our network. So we have a large Wi-Fi deployment maybe, but my first uh, recommendation would be to have parallel uh, security settings in one or the other. Thank you, Carlos. One final question, Miguel Rodriguez. Do you mean that it's easier for content suppliers to adopt it instead of uh, this to be done by internet users? Well, I'm not saying it's one or the other. I'm saying that we still need both. We need users to access content in IP v uh, sex and we need content in IP v sex as well. Well, we mostly, I mean, this in in a in a way there are different worlds. One is content, one is access. Although there are players on both sides, few, but there are. These have happened at different times, and they sort of encourage one another. Well, they impact one another both positively and negatively. It just depends when we look at it. For example, ICSPs at some point say, "I'm not going to deploy IPv6 because there's no content anyway." That's what they used to say in the past. Now, overnight content has sprung up. And I'm saying overnight because literally after I, uh, 2000 and IPv6 uh, launched 2012, 13, I can't remember exactly. Overnight we had content. It wasn't a lot, but it was quite substantial. It was Google, it was Facebook and so on. So those were the first deployments of IPv6. Uh, so that sort of encouraged one another sort of, there's some sort of uh, connection that one pulls the other one. So if you're asking me where we are, at, 
in that cycle where we need, a, I would say, additional push from the content side.